So we've been in this uh, series of messages. Chris and I are doing like we're like tag team wrestlers, you know. Uh, he's uh, in shape and gifted and strong, and I'm like junkyard dog, and we just you know hand this off week to week. So um, we've been looking at uh, conversations, encounters that Jesus has with people uh, in our preparation for moving towards uh, Easter, and uh, each one's been a little bit different. Uh, Jesus treats people uniquely, and uh, I believe that there's uh, just a, a wealth of lessons for us um, in these encounters. And the walls will come down. <laughs> Sounds like my home last night. We had this, we are having some work done, and they took the windows out and put plastic over them, and then we had 50 mile an hour winds last night, which was like... <laughs> 2.30 in the morning, I'm walking around in my underwear going, is the house falling down? <laughs> anyway, that has nothing to do with the message. It's just, uh, it's like, when I heard the crash, I, I had kind of PTSD there. So uh, anyway, uh, I want us to look at John chapter 1. And the reason is because in, in this chapter, it, I think it's one of the most amazing uh, parts of the whole Bible. Uh, it begins with what's really an anthem, a theological anthem. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word was God, and He was in, you know, and it goes on and on, and, and how uh, He entered the world, but uh, His own people rejected Him, but many as uh, received Him, they uh, became children of God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen His glory. Um, and this fabulous passage that, um, if you're taking notes, you know, I, I want you to read that at my funeral. It's a fabulous reminder of uh, God entering our world. So, not not this week, but you know, when it's time. And then it shifts in same chapter. It shifts in to Jesus' cousin John the Baptist and his preaching and his ministry and his baptizing and uh, and his. Uh, talking about the one who's going to come, who's going to baptize with the Spirit. And, and, uh, and then it moves into uh, the calling of the very first disciples and how they connected with Jesus and what happened there. And that's what I want us to, to focus on today. Um, so I want to read a beginning in... Uh, I'll set these papers down. I want to read beginning in uh, verse 35. Uh, the next day... Uh, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? I think that was a fair question. It wasn't like me who says, uh, What do you want? <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, but um, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Uh, come and see, Jesus says. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. And it was about the 10th hour. And Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what uh, John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah. And uh, he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You'll now be Cephas, which is translated Peter, uh, which means the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, so he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida, and Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Job. So, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of there? Nathaniel asked, come and see, said John. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, here is a true Israelite in whom there's nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? You'll see greater things than that. And then he added, I tell you the truth, you'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And that's how the chapter ends. So we pray with you. Lord, teach us from the Word. Teach us how we might 
come to you or respond when you come to us and give us the courage, Lord, to, to um, be open and willing to follow you at your call. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we were looking at the encounter Jesus had with this man who had been 38 years uh, disabled on the side of the pool, and Jesus asked a very strange question, do you want to be well? Which he never asked again, as far as we know in the Bible. Uh, but this time, he asked a different question. What is it? What do you want? What do you want? And I thought about that. That may be one of the great questions that we all need to consider in life. What do you want out of life? What do you want in your relationships? What do you want from God? What do you want? What do you want? It matters when we come into church because all of us come here wanting something. We may not even be consciously aware of it, but there's something going on inside that says, you don't think I ought to go to church because, you know, i got to find out what I want. And uh, it was interesting. I had a friend who worked uh, for a, uh, a magazine that was uh, sold in the um, book stands in the uh, Muslim world, and uh, mostly young adults. It was targeted for 16 to 26 year old young adult Muslims. Uh, it was called the Magala magazine. And uh, they had a survey with their readers years ago, and their survey was what would be the most important thing that you could ask God to do for you? Pretty good question, isn't it? And there are all kinds of answers. The third most frequently answered was, give me health. That makes sense, doesn't it? The second, give me success. Most important thing I could ask God to do for me. Give me success. The number one most asked question in the response, forgive my sins. Isn't that interesting? What do you want? Um, you want help? You want success? You want forgiveness? You want a fresh start? Uh, you want your life to make sense? What do you want? Um, okay, I tried this uh, with Eileen and Damien last night and got zero positive response, okay? Uh, I love the far side, okay? I get that. Uh, Gary Larson's a genius. So he has this desert island, and uh, this guy's on the desert island, trapped there, isolated, and there's the genie with the magic lamp. You tell him he can have three wishes. You know, what do you want? And the guy says, I got rhythm, I got music. Who could ask for anything more? <laughs> Okay, see, now, <laughs> okay, I get this. This is kindness. Uh, I think they went, Dad, don't do that. <laughs> Gosh. Honey, don't. So, don't forget it. Just strike that in your mind. <laughs> Who could ask for anyone? What do you want? Uh, we're going to see something here that is, it may sound confusing to you, but I want us to look at it anyway. And that is that, um, this is a very interesting picture of how Jesus draws people to himself. And I think it's a picture of how he draws us to himself. So, John the Baptist has two followers, and uh, they hear him say, look, there goes the, the Lamb of God. And, uh, and so they go after Jesus. And, and the unnamed one, uh, uh, historians say, was probably John who wrote the gospel because he never identifies himself. He's never mentioned in the whole gospel. And so he was probably one of those two. Um, and Jesus asked them a question, what do you want? What do you want? Do you get their answer? Uh, where do you live? You have a chance to meet the living Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, and, and he says, what do you want? And you say, could I check out your apartment? <laughs> That's what I want. I mean, 
But that's what the Bible says. That was their response. And instead of him saying, you idiot, <laughs> that's so dumb. Go back to John. You know, he doesn't do that. What does he do? Come and see. You want to know where I live? Come and see. He doesn't say, you know, really, there are better questions that I can help you. <laughs> but come and see. That's what you want? Come see. I'm open. And they went and they spent a day with him. And then things began to happen. And I got to tell you, at first it's kind of confusing because there's all these different characters popping in every other verse, right? And uh, Andrew is there first with John, and then it turns out Andrew is Simon Peter's brother, right? Uh, the fishing business uh, with Andrew. And so anyway, so he, he goes and gets his brother, Simon, and says, oh man, you got to come. We can't believe who we found. And Simon, Simon comes. And, um, and then you notice what Jesus does with him? First thing, he changes his identity. Simon uh, means uh, observer, watcher, kind of the one who just sort of sees how to, how to, streams going and get in you know, different places. Uh, and then he became uh, the solid one, the rock. Um, Jesus called out something in him that uh, he probably didn't even know he had. And uh, basically he said, all your life up until now, you've been an observer. But now you're the rock. You're the solid. And then uh, it says um, Jesus went the next day and he um, found Philip. Philip wasn't looking for him. Philip wasn't following him. Philip wasn't saying, hey, I got a question. You know, uh, Jesus went and, and found Philip, who may be the patron saint of shy people. You know, if you think about it, he's the one who didn't move towards Jesus. Jesus went after him and says, follow me. And so... He does, and then he goes and um, grabs Nathaniel. And they're all in the same little town, fishing business, all that stuff, so they all know each other. He finds Nathaniel and says, we found the one Moses talked about in the law. We found him. And, uh, and Nathaniel goes, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. What, what are you talking about? Jesus of Nazareth. That's like saying, you know, Bellevue. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Can anything good come out of Bellevue? But, you know, I'm sorry. We're going to have to take that off the tape, too. I'm just, you know, it's going to be one of those days. We're just going to edit. <laughs> sorry, America. <laughs> but, you know, you think about it. And, uh, yeah, that town, that, nothing good comes out of there. And so he says, come and see. The same response that Jesus gave him, right? Come and see. So he does. And then... Uh, Jesus treats him like an individual, so instead of him, he doesn't change his name, does he? Uh, he says, oh, you're a, you're a true Israelite. You're, you're, you're an Israelite with no guile, with no, uh, no conning and no covering up and no keeping a deal going, you know? No secret. You're just, you're just open. And if Daniel doesn't say, uh, well, I don't know, you know, this is a different kind of, he, what does he say? How did you know me? I am that. I am someone with no guile, no secrets. I'm just open. That's who I am. And Jesus said, well, I saw you. You know, when you're sitting on the tree over there, and, and I saw you, and uh, realized you're, you're an honest person. And then he says to him, you're going to see more than this. You're going to see angels going up and down uh, to heaven and on the ladder. And, that and that's a reference. Let me tell you the little reference, okay? Just so you know. Uh, Two brothers, Jacob and Esau, remember them in the Old Testament? And Esau was the hairy guy, the brother, and he got his inheritance stolen by Jacob. He, he hooked up a deal with his mom and betrayed the father and stole the inheritance, betrayed the son, and then took off because he figured his older brother's going to kill him now. So um, he'd run for his life. And he spends his whole life conning and trying to, you know, make things work for himself and trying to get ahead. In fact, uh, his, his name meant ankle grabber. 
literally in the Hebrew, because they were twins, and, and Esau was coming out first, and evidently the baby Jacob grabbed the ankle, tried to pull him back, you know, <laughs> wait a minute, you're not getting ahead of me. And so, um, and there's this, this part where uh, he has a dream, he has a vision, that he sees angels going up and down this ladder to heaven and uh, back and forth, and he has the, and he wrestles all night long with one of these angels, and he ends up getting uh, a disability from it, and um, and he says to the angel, "I'm not going to let you go until you bless me." And and he became the one who fought for it, basically. That's what his name, the one who fought for it, changed from ankle grabber to. I'm going to fight for what I want. And, uh, and his name was then changed to Israel. Jacob became Israel. And, uh, and so Jesus is tying this all in with Daniel and saying, you know, you're, you're like the one who fights for it, but you don't have any secret. You don't have any, any con going on in you. You, you are the pure one. You're, you have no guile. Now, look at all of these different encounters. What do you notice about them? That we can draw from. Are they just interesting little stories about people and you know clever things about their names and stuff, or, or is there something happening here? See, one of the things that stands out for me is Jesus didn't have a cookie cutter way of approaching people, right? Each one was different. Uh, he treated them. Uh, he respected them enough to treat them as people, and they had a past. They had a future. They had temperament issues, they had relational issues, they had all these things going on, and he took them seriously enough that he didn't dismiss them or just lump them all together. I don't know if you ever been anywhere where you get lumped together with everybody. It's not all that fun. Um, yeah, I, I just personal okay, confession time. I found that it was really easy for me to preach to like a thousand people than to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. That seems scarier somehow, you know, uh, because I could just love men and go, all you people are just like this, <laughs> you know, and you're sitting there going, well, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm more like that, you know, but as long as I could lump you all together, I could just, you know, not know you, not be involved with you, and of course you wouldn't have to know me, and so we can keep a good safe distance by just generalizing. And Jesus absolutely would not do that. He took each one where they were. Some, he had them come to him. And then he asked them what they wanted. He didn't say, why do you want to come to my house? That's stupid. Why don't we just talk out here? He didn't do any of that. He, said, he responded to their issues. He sought out the ones who were shy, invited them to come along. And I really want you to see this. You know who you are, and you know what you've been through, and you know what you're carrying with you today, and you know what went on this week that shapes who you are this morning and affects you as you're sitting here positively or negatively. You know that, and I want you to know that the living Lord Jesus knows you. He knows you. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're afraid of or what you're excited about. He knows what torments you. He knows what keeps you up at night. Work. He knows what you need forgiven and he knows what you need blessed. He knows you. Not us generically. He knows you. And when we realize that, it can change everything. It really can. Because I want to follow a Savior who knows me. I don't want to follow a Savior who's just looking for 12 people randomly. And he knows you. Now, the second thing that stood out for me is that the way Jesus relates to us is always personal. He didn't sit them down and lecture them on Christology 
Uh, he didn't lecture them on the fine points of uh, uh, the Pentateuch and the meaning for uh, this generation. He didn't do any of that. He's like, come and hang out at the house. What kind of ministry is that? What kind of evangelism is that? Come and hang out at the house? And when he, and when he said to, to Philip, come follow me, I could just imagine Philip saying, okay, where? As far as we know, he never says. Well, well where are we going to stay? Who are we going to see? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? How am I going to explain this to my family? Jesus seems pretty silent about that, right? Come follow me. As far as we know, Jesus never, ever implemented a 10-step discipleship program with a workbook. He never did that. It was just, come and see. Let's be together. And in the process, transformation comes. Now, There's another part of this. I would love it personally. I can tell you this. That's no secret. I would love it if Jesus were to come to me and say, John, I see you're, you've got a lot of leadership issues. You know, you got all, you're a wonderful person. You know, and, you know, you've got, you have some Westphalian characteristics, but I can overlook those. And, uh, you know, why don't you follow me? And I go, Lord, that's right. You and me. Let's do it. But did you notice in this passage what a mess of people it became? Seriously, a mess of people? That's the Greek word. <laughs> oh my golly, there's friends and family and neighbors and people from the town are sitting by themselves. They're, they're all in there now. And they're all saying, okay, we'll follow Jesus. What a nightmare. Do you know how awkward that can be if you're following Jesus with others? Well, some of you do because we've been doing that a little bit, haven't we? Um, yeah, the thing I've found is that Jesus calls all these people to follow him, taking into account their individual stuff, their personal, the very one-on-one -on -one thing, and then he says, great, all of y'all, let's go. And they all went. What do you mean, all y'all? <coughs> it was in southern Jerusalem. And, uh, and so, um, but he... Uh, he called them to follow him with these other people. And I think that's where things can go a little sideways, don't you think? Now, I'm going to drop this. I stole this board from the um, preschool downstairs, so we've got to get it back or by tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, those of you who are into learning theory, you know, there's nothing new to you, but this uh, bear with me here. Okay, so if, um, wait, I need a volunteer. Oh, that's what you get for sitting in the front row. Come on <laughs> Give her a hand. Come on up. She's an artist. I know she is, and then she's going to be doing the wrong thing for her kids. <laughs> you can hold that so you can see your face a little bit there, you know. A little bit. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. So here's what a relationship looks like. Okay. There's. Uh, well, there, uh, I'm not an artist, so there's a uh, you know one person you know with the shoes, feet, and arms, and you know. Okay. Hair. Okay. So there's a person, right? And then you have another person. Yeah. Sure. Blame the pen, John. <laughs> okay, so now you have a pen and you have another person here and they have their, their feet and... Don't, don't look at me like that! <laughs> don't look at me like that! <laughs> okay, now you have two people here, right? <laughs> exciting, isn't it? Okay, now, this is what their relationship is like. Right there. They communicate with each other. 
They relate to each other. Right? Right. That's not complicated. You know, that's not rocket surgery. Okay, so, but now, if you add in some other people, I'm getting better at this, I think. Okay, so you have, uh, I'm angry. <laughs> Okay, now you have some other people. Um, more, more hair, long hair, and hippies. Okay, so now you have, okay, so now you have this one relationship, right? Now you have two relationships, three relationships, four relationships, five relationships, six relationships. All of a sudden, you have four people, and you have six relationships. This is starting to get murky. Get that? Okay. Murky means muddy. Kind of, you know, there's an opportunity for uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding. You might say something to this person and they heard it wrong. And, you know, things can go wrong when there's six relationships among four people. Right? Thank you. You're right. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. See, now, I know you're thinking you could have done better. <laughs> now, just to show you how this, has anybody ever been in a small group? Yeah. At some time in your life, nobody puts their hand up. Are you ashamed? <laughs> <laughs> or do you think I'm going to call you up here? <laughs> okay, so a few of you have been in small groups, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, more than two people in a room. And, uh, or you're in an office, you're working in an office with uh, some people, right? Or you come to a church with some people? When we started Harbor Church, there were eight. Three were the West Falls, you know. But um, uh, there were complexities there. But now look what happens if you have 10 people. This isn't even as many as the disciples were. There were 12 of them plus Jesus. That's 13. There, this isn't even that. This is just 10 people, like a small group. This is the relationships. I was going to draw this for you, but it takes a little time. Okay? There are 50 relationships if you have 10 people in your group. 50 relationships. That is complex, right? I was almost going to say that's a problem. But it's also an opportunity, right? And so when God calls, no wonder out of 12, one of them blew up. You know, Judas was kind of washed out on that one. That was a lot of complexity in those relationships. But there's 50 relationships among 10 people. Now you look around, here we go, okay, now so we'd have like 400 relationships represented in this room? It's a miracle we've never had a misunderstanding. <laughs> See, I think that God made us to be in a relationship with him, with others. Right there in John chapter 1. It would have been so nice if we had that big theology. In the beginning was the Word, the Word became flesh, the Lord dwelt in And then John the Baptist says, oh yeah, Jesus is the one. And then Jesus calls somebody and they follow him and the chapter ends. Wouldn't that be nice? And you'd go, wow, following Jesus is easy. Instead, he turns it into this, this maze of relationships and says, let me be in the middle of this. Let me be in the middle of this so that I have a relationship with every one of you and you have a relationship with every one of them. And we're going to do this together. And you know what? There is no way that this can work apart from a divine miracle. It takes a miracle for us to go. Have you been to a family reunion? <laughs> Even if they're fairly good people. No. Well, there's always Uncle Buford who's had a little problem, you know, but, uh, you know, sorry if you have an Uncle Buford or if you are, but, uh, you know, the thing is, Jesus calls us to this. The complexity of it, the, the histories, the sharing and caring and loving and struggling and growing together with him right in the middle and said, let me be in the center and you follow me together. 
This is the picture of the church of Jesus Christ. As hard as that is, you're not lost in that because he treats you with respect because he knows you, he made you, he loves you, he gave his life for you, he calls you to follow him. You're no stranger to him. Sometimes we're strangers to each other though. And if we're gonna follow Jesus like he calls us to, we've got to stop being strangers to each other. It means we've got to take the time to say, come and see. Come and see. You want to see what my life's like? Come and see. You want to be loved? Let yourself be known. Because you've heard me say you can only love to the extent that you're known. And then something powerful happens. Because like these first disciples, we start finding ourselves in life connected to people not like us in other places. And this is how evangelism works. Chris talked about this last week. We're sharing. We're not sharing theology. We're not going out and, and fixing everybody. Telling them, you know, they really need me to fix you. But we find our lives connected. Years and years ago, Damien was in a, in a he used to do a lot of plays. And uh, he, he did the uh, Elwood P. Down part of uh, mm -hmm. you know, Harvey, you remember the seven foot rabbit and uh, Jimmy Stewart? Back when Jimmy Stewart talked slow and haltingly. Anyway, uh, so Damien had the part, and I was watching because I was the dad, so I would watch it many, many times. And I, and I wrote down one of the talks that um, Elwood P. Down gave. This is what he said Harvey and I sit in the bar. Soon, the faces of the others turn towards mine and smile, and they say, we don't know you. We don't know your name, mister, but you seem like a nice fellow. Harvey and I, we warm ourselves at these golden moments. We've entered as strangers, and soon we have friends. They come up to us. They sit with us. They drink with us. They talk to us. They tell us about the big trouble things that they've done, big, terrible things that they've done. I can't even read my writing. <laughs> the big, wonderful things they will do. They talk about their hopes, their regrets, their loves, their hates. And it's all very large because nobody brings anything small into a bar. I wrote that down because I thought that's what I want our church to be. A place where we can come in and we notice each other and we come over and pretty soon we're sharing our stories and we're and we're learning to care and we're learning to share and, and we realize we don't need to keep secrets and, and we don't have to be people of guile and pretty soon we realize something big is happening here. Because it's happening inside you and inside me and inside the person across from you. And we share communion together. Jesus forms us into his body through all of this. 